Okay, uh, so we covered PCR, and now we're going to talk a little bit about blots, um, and these allow you to further analyze DNA, RNA, and proteins. Um, so there's three types of blots that we're going to cover. There's the southern blot, there's the northern blot, and there's the western blot, and they are used to analyze different molecules. So the southern blot is used to analyze genomic DNA, the northern blot analyzes RNA, and the western blot is used to analyze proteins. So um, the first two approaches are kind of similar to each other because DNA and RNA are very similar molecules. Um, so you have hybridization between complementary nucleic acids in order to detect them. Um, northern blot also has hybridization to detect them. Uh, and in western blot, the methodology is, is different uh, because there's no way to, to identify proteins through complementary sequence. And so instead you use uh, molecules called antibodies. Um, so you should understand most of the basics of a, of a blot. You start out with a gel, so you, you, you run a gel, a DNA sample, um, through a gel, and the DNA is separated by size through electrophoresis. So uh, you have, of course, the positive charge on this side, the negative charge on this side, and then the negative DNA runs towards the positive charge, and because it's running through a gel, the shorter pieces go faster and the longer pieces go slower. Um, it's important that the sample that you've loaded is genomic DNA, so you've already, um, you've already uh, purified out things like the RNA and protein because you've, you, you're, you're, you're using a purified genomic DNA sample. And then finally, it's important to note that the sizes of these fragments are not random um, because we have treated the DNA with restriction enzymes. So we talked earlier about what restriction enzymes are. They allow you to cut at very particular sequences. And so if you take you know, an entire genomic DNA sample, let's say this is chromosome one from humans, this is chromosome two, and you treat it with a six cutter like eco R1, then um, you're gonna cut wherever there's a a recognition site for this. And so you're gonna be left with very precise sizes. And so you run this out in gel, and now you wanna detect, the idea is that you wanna detect one fragment um, of, of, the, of the region. And so let's say you have your gene of interest, hemoglobin. You know, hemoglobin is not on chromosome one, but you know, some sort of gene in chromosome one. So you design a probe that is, is complementary to what you're looking for. And then this probe also has some sort of way to detect it, either radioactivity um, or a fluorescent label. So we have this running through the gel and now we need some way for the um, probe to be able to recognize the pieces that we're interested in. So you can't just put this on, on the gel, unfortunately. There's, there's no way for the, the probe to diffuse through the gel to recognize the pieces. And so you have this extra step in order to transfer the DNA from this gel onto paper that, you're, that, that you could use, um, you, that you can use for, for these purposes. And so the idea is that you have um, the gel. So the gel is right here. And then you also have some sort of liquid in order to keep it wet. And you have DNA binding paper. So typically this is something like nitrocellulose that has a, neg uh, that has a positive charge. Um, so the negative DNA will bind to it. And then you have a bunch of paper towels and weight to kind of weigh it all down. So um, because there is liquid at the bottom and it is dry at the top. There's capillary action in effect. So capillary action, you know, if you have a wet paper, if you have a dry paper towel and you know you put some some water on one end of it, this liquid will actually um, flow through the paper towel uh, due to capillary action. And so the same principle is at play here. So there's liquid down here. There's dry paper towels right here. And so the liquid naturally wants to run through the gel, through the paper, and then into the dry, uh, dry paper towels. And so the process of this liquid flowing actually moves the DNA. So the DNA remains in place in, in, in this direction, but it now is able to flow in the, in the orthogonal direction through the gel, and then it gets stuck on the DNA binding paper.
And so the whole idea of this thing right here is just to transfer the DNA from the gel onto this onto onto a nitrous cellulose paper um, or some other type of paper. Um, and so once this happens, now you can take your probe and you can flow it on the paper and you can rely on the fact that the complementary sequences will find each other and hybridization will occur. So again, you melt the DNA apart and then you add the probe, it hybridizes to complementary sequence. And so, and so you just put this liquid in a heat sealed bag or a tube with solution. Um, so somehow you just, you just bathe the paper um, with this probe. And so now we can, we can use this paper in order to detect um, the signal that we want um, because all of this probe will, will you know, bind to whatever sequence it, it wants to. And so if you expose this on a film, then in the end what you see are bands. So you might have a ladder um, in the first lane. So this is just like a DNA ladder to tell you, tell you the standards. And in this case, we have two samples. Um, so one sample, um, both samples have one band um, that, that is one size, and then you'll notice the other um, pro ones have, uh, you know, two, this, this one, lane three has two bands, um, additional bands, and lane two has a different band. And so this allows us to, to this allows us to analyze DNA um, and, and actually target DNA regions of interest. You can also do the exact same thing with RNA. So here we've used DNA, we loaded DNA, but um, instead we could have purified RNA from a sample. And so in that case, um, we, we do almost everything the same. Um, the RNA separates out by size, we transfer it to filter paper, and then we use radioactive probes in order to, to bind to the mRNA sequence that, that we are interested in. And so you would see something like this for a gel as well. Um, so this is just an, a real life example of what something looks like. Um, so the two key differences between the southern blot and the northern blot that I want you to know. So one is the source material that is used. So the reason northern blots analyze RNA, southern blots analyze DNA, is because the northern is because you you choose which source material to use. So you change your purification protocol to isolate DNA versus RNA. And then the second important difference is what determines the size. So why is there size differences on this gel? Why are we able to separate out these pieces? So in the first case, the size of the DNA pieces is determined by the restriction enzyme recognition sites. So how exactly the location of those, those sites occurs determines um, the length of the DNA. Whereas for northern blot analysis, it's just simply the size of the RNA pieces is determined by the length of the gene. And so, and so you have an mRNA you know, for hemoglobin and all of the mRNAs for that are pretty much exactly the same size. And then you have an mRNA for the gene like myoglobin, and all of those are the same. But this might be 2,000 base pairs. Um, this might be 1,000 base pairs. And so the mRNA for each one can be a different size. So this, this is how you run a northern blot or a southern blot. And then we'll also talk a, a little bit about a Western plot. So what if we want to analyze protein? Um, so if we want to be able to de detect protein in the same way. Um, so again, one of the key differences is your source. So you isolate proteins from a sample. Um, typically you degrade the DNA and the RNA within it in the process of, of lysing um, the sample in order to get the protein. And then you again want to be able to um, separate the proteins by size by using a gel. Um, so this is a picture. So, so the, the gel looks a little bit different. Um, it's typically run between two different glass plates. It's a thinner type of gel. It's a different material. It's called polyacrylamide versus agarose. Um, and, and the idea is that you run it in this direction, in the vertical direction. And so each sample would have like its own little well like this that you would load it into. And then you would run electrophoresis and the, the proteins would again separate by size. 
And so the smaller proteins run faster than the larger proteins. Again, you need some sort of way to transfer the material, the protein in this case, from the gel onto, onto a membrane. So we're transferring onto a nitrocellulose membrane. And so in this case, in, instead of using buffer, we use another electrophoresis step. So this is a transfer process where you know prior the proteins ran in the positive direction in this way. And so now we switch the electro, electric field so that the electric field runs this way towards positive. And so the proteins, if we sandwich everything together, um, the proteins will run off of the gel and onto the paper. So this, just imagine, is like completely sandwiched and held together and all in liquid. So now we have the proteins nicely on the, um, the proteins nicely on the, um, the gel, the paper. And so now how do we detect that? And this is where we need to use a special type of protein called antibodies. So antibodies are another example of a toolkit gene, um, but these were actually uh, identified through fundamental studies of the acquired uh, immune system. So studies of T cells and B cells and how they work, how do they recognize pathogens, how, how are we able to fight off diseases like coronavirus, um, how do vaccines work, so all of, this, all of this work led to the identification of antibodies, which are proteins that recognize specific molecular signatures. So you have an antibody in this case that recognizes maybe this batch of amino acids on this protein. And so if you have you know, all sorts of different proteins on this membrane, this antibody is not going to bind to these other ones. It's only going to rot, recognize its target. So the idea is that you have an antibody that's specific to your protein that you're interested in. Um, and typically the way you do this is, is you would raise this in something like rats or rabbits, where you would inject this protein into the rabbit's blood, and then the rabbit would develop antibodies against that protein, and then you would, you would isolate the antibodies from the rabbit. Um, and then you have a secondary antibody. So the reason to have a second antibody is just for, for cheapness and utility. And the secondary antibody also has some sort of um, radioactive or more likely fluorescent um, or some sort of tag that allows you to detect it in the same way we, we use you know, radioactivity and, and imaging gels to, to recognize the presence of the bands. This yellow just recognizes uh, is is represents that sort of that sort of marker, um, and so then you have the secondary antibody, and so the second antibody might be raised in goats, um, but basically what this recognizes is any sort of antibody. So it recognizes this chain of the antibody. So anything that was raised in rats, let's say, so that this was raised in rats. So any antibody recognized that was raised in rats will be recognized by this antibody which was raised in goats. So this is a secondary and this is conjugated. I know, very, very confusing at first. So um, the key differences between the Western blot and the Northern Southern blots. Um, so one is the protein sample. So you use protein instead of DNA and RNA. And so this also presents a problem because uh, proteins are not negatively charged. So DNA is negatively charged and that's because of the um, the phosphate backbone. The phosphate backbone all has negative charges embedded upon it. Um, it's an acid, and so you can use that in order to, to provide a force on the molecules. But for protein, um, the backbone doesn't have any sort of positive or negative charge. So in general, most proteins will be slightly positive or slightly negative. Um, but if you add this molecule called SDS, SDS is a detergent, so one of the things it does is it denatures pro proteins, so it, it goes from like a 3D structure into like a single-stranded structure. It binds to, so this detergent is able to bind non-specifically to proteins, and then it adds a negative charge, so this detergent also has a negative charge on it. And so we've artificially negatively charged the protein by the addition of SDS, so it's important to remember that um, we, why we add SDS is in order to provide a negative charge um, on the protein molecules.
And then um, the other key difference is that we have to have some so sort of way to recognize individual proteins. And so we can't rely on complementary sequence, double-stranded DNA. Um, so we have to have a different approach and that's the antibody approach. So we use antibodies to recognize proteins of interest. And so again, we have to have um, a way to create these antibodies in order to do this. Um, and this can be a case where you know genetic engineering comes to the rescue. So this might be a, a reason why you would want to engineer a plasmid that allows the expression of a large amount of protein. So if you're interested in hemoglobin, if you clone, clone the hemoglobin mRNA into an expression construct, then you could force the bacteria to make a large amount of hemoglobin. And then you take that protein, you would inject it into a rat, and then you would allow the rat to create the antibodies for you. All right.